Hey everybody, Brad here. And joining me today is Robbie Swal from Reason and Rising. Robbie, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. Good to talk to you, Brad. So we're here to talk about Tech Panic, your new-ish book. Uh, I remember I went I went to your uh, book launch uh, party a while back, and I am a bad friend, so it took me a while to read your book. But I did about a month ago, uh, and I have I have a, a bone to pick with you from the get go. Okay. And this is you didn't read your own audio book, and so when I, oh. I listen to nonfiction. <laughs> I don't read nonfiction because I read articles all day, so I usually listen to Audible uh, for for nonfiction. And so I listened, but and it was great, but it was hard for me because when you know the author, when you have heard them on podcasts, when you've met them in real life, and then there's some rando reading their audiobook, it's just a letdown. Reading the uh, producing the audiobook is a chore. I did it for my first book, my previous book. And, uh, you know, I'm someone who's on camera a lot. I do a lot of podcast type things like you do. And even so, the audiobook, uh, reading it, apparently the sound quality is so sensitive that they pick up you breathing too loudly. Like every sentence itself feels like a take. The, eventually you get into a groove of it and you can go like a page or a page and a half without them stopping to say, oh, you slipped up. But it's like a, it's like a, you're holding your breath. Kind of, it's... It was hard. It was really, it was uh, it was amazingly difficult. So I was relieved not to do it for the second book. Yeah, I get it. I've heard from lots of friends who've published books that it's brutal, uh, it which kind of surprises me because I, it doesn't seem like it should be. But I believe you. Uh, anyway, in, in all seriousness, you know the kind of premise of your first book and this book is about panics. And one thing that you did it, it, that I just honestly had never heard about was you went up and dug up a bunch of like what people said at the time about various forms of new technology, right? Like the New York Times on the radio or whatever. Talk us through some of those examples and what you found about how in the past, you know, people are always freaked out about new things. Absolutely. And that's what everyone who's extremely worried about social media has to keep in mind is that there's this long, long history of whatever the new technology is, particularly the new communications technology, of that being fretted about by um, policymakers, pundits, thinkers, and then also the voices who use the previous technology, media companies. So, you know, you, you probably remember in your own lifetime, you know, video games or, or, or TV before that being, being worried about how addiction to these, to these things. But prior to that, I found all these examples of the New York Times is a particularly bad offender here. Editorials, articles being written about the danger that radio posed, um, or radios in our cars, how distracted we'll be, how, how we won't have conversations with people because we'll always be having something to listen to, uh, which sounds ridiculous today, but there was all this uh, writing and reporting on that. Before that, you can go as far back as the, I found examples of the New York Times panicked about the phonograph. Uh, they, <laughs> I don't they, even they, know what that is, really. <laughs> It's that, you know, the, okay, now I confess I barely know what it is. It's like you crank a dial and it's, it's an early phone. It's an early telephone, um, you, you, like recording device. Uh, so it's just, you know, before that you can go back, uh, the written word was worried about. Uh, there, you know, there are old, old, like ancient Greek and Roman philosophers saying, oh no, if people write things down, they won't, they won't be able to recall facts and information anymore. Um, it's really, it's really a long-running fear that whatever the new communications platform is, it will be bad for society. It will be unhealthy. It will be addictive. It will make us worse off. And that's important to keep in mind as we look at social media. And we should ask ourselves: Do some of these complaints sound familiar? And did these complaints, uh, did these concerns, were they borne out at any time in the past? And usually they were not. Yeah, I mean, you kind of you see this. Maybe this is just a piece of human nature. But people are always resistant to new things. You think about the tremendous backlash against the automobile and all, you know, the uh, buggy drivers that will be put out of business. And it's like there's this inherent status quo bias that we observe in lots of walks of life. But I do think, you know, it, it was a really interesting point I hadn't necessarily seen people make that when you see this panic about social media addiction, it's controlling our brains. They've hacked the human psyche. I think, yeah, we do need to take some deep breaths, but you know, I also, I personally have felt like social media can be addicting. I, I've, I've put limits and, and I've, I've been able to manage it, I think, pretty well. But 
and you say this in the book, it's not entirely illegitimate to feel like this technology can be addictive and can be harmful in some ways, right? Walk us through the exact nuances of your position on is this technology bad for us or not? Sure. And substantially what I'm trying to do in the book is just remind people that for all of our complaints and our criticisms and our concerns, there are upsides to social media. It is great that it is so easy to communicate across the globe more easily than ever before, to form deliberate social communities of like-minded people or like-interested people. You know, I'm in forums for video games. I've met people all around the world that share my interests. Um, that a generation ago, you'd have to have pen pals or something. It's just fantastic. It's amazing how much easier it is to facilitate these things. Are there downsides? Sure. Ba- everything, if used in excess, can be bad. And everything can be, most things, can be addictive for a small number of people. Are some people using social media too much and it's negatively impacting their mental health? Absolutely. I, I don't think there's any debate about that. Can young people, if their time on social media is not limited, use it too much and can it be bad for them? Certainly. But there's nothing novel about that. Look, I probably, when I was a kid, I probably would have played video games 24 hours a day if I was allowed to, but my mother limited me to one hour a day. So I played it for one hour a day and, you know, was an otherwise well-adjusted, you know, person who did their assignments and had IRL friends, etc. I don't see why a similar thing is not possible for social media. I understand it's a little harder because social media is much more ubiquitous, but and I would limit, I, I think parents should absolutely feel empowered to limit the age at which they're, uh, or, or wait till later for their kids to get smartphones. Um, yes, take the phones away before bedtime, you know, make sure young people are getting enough sleep. I think that's probably, if you want to get into the, the depression and the mental illness, I actually think a lot of it coming from social media is just that they're on their phones too late and then it, it's hard to sleep and you know, you're looking at the screen, the blue light, et cetera. Um, I, I totally imp- support empowering parents to feel like they should, they should have more responsibility or more direction over their, their kids' social media use. But the answer is not to prevent people from using social media entirely because that is much worse for their mental health. If you look at the, if you look at the statistics, the kids who are most depressed are ones who have no friends and no access to social media because that is most alienating of all. Yeah, talk to us for a minute. Uh, I was surprised you you talked to or quoted multiple experts about like what do the data say about this question? What's the impact social media use has on teenagers? What did you find when you investigated that? Yeah, the data, look, the the information that was presented by the Facebook whistleblower um, a couple months ago, uh, specifically looking at how Instagram was making a subset of users, it was just teenage girls, and some, according to internal surveys that Meta had conducted, did show that, okay, yes, um, t- some teen girls were having negative mental health, n- negative experiences on the platform. It was negatively harming their mental health. But even so, it wasn't all of them. It wasn't all, certainly wasn't all users of Instagram. Most people, most young people, are well-adjusted and are using these platforms to connect with their friends in a socially healthy way. The ones that are not, you should put limits on them. Uh, it, it, like it, it's not within our power to fix, is, is what I'm saying. Some of the platforms are more harmful than others. Uh, yes, I see why Instagram, in the same way that glossy magazines are bad for some young women's um, body image, kind of self-perception, or can exacerbate um, unhealthy stereotypes. That's all true. There's nothing new about that. That's, that's very, again, glossy magazines have done that forever. Um, should should the company pursue healthier you know ways of fostering body image? Sure, they they should absolutely take this into consideration. But it is not a crisis at all. And in fact, being a young person is just difficult. It's mentally taxing. In fact, and now we have a language. Um, it, it used to be that people, young people, all people, were hesitant to talk openly about their mental health, their depression, etc. It was it was it was stigmatized. I think it's almost unstigmatized now to a frightening degree like everyone wants to brag about their therapist yeah everyone wants to talk about their mental health it's 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 better than before but everyone's chalk everything up to mental health so i think some of that the data some of the increases in mental unwellness just reflect that that people are perfectly comfortable talking about it now and also that it's tough being a it's tough being a teen i bet if you ask this same survey group you know, how, do you, how does school make you feel? You have like 90% of them say it makes me feel depressed, like more than Instagram makes them feel. So, you know, what does that tell you? 
Well, and, and you mentioned something early on there that I was really fascinated to learn reading this book, which is that there's a lot of cases where there's no data suggesting that it does hurt teenagers to use social media. But on Instagram in particular, there's some evidence that it hurts some teenage girls' mental health, but not teenage boys. Why would that be? And wouldn't that suggest that the problem isn't necessarily the technology, but, but how it's being used? Yeah, I, th I think uh, teenage girls, I mean, you know, some certain sex stereotypes are real. Uh, men and women are, are different in their, you know, vast sociological preferences. Uh, it seems to be the case that women are more sensitive to um, negative uh, or body image competition, essentially, seeing, seeing a very photoshopped or enhanced or filtered um, uh, images of, of, uh, of beautiful people or even friends of theirs who are more beautiful or have been made to look more beautiful can have a more negative effect on their self-esteem uh, than, than boys do. Certainly that can happen for boys too, but it's more common uh, for women. Also, the, the kinds of um, social media environments that um, uh, boys are disproportionately using are like video games, things like that, are actually kind of healthy. <laughs> I know that's uh, probably, a, if any boomers are watching, they find that hard to believe because of all the video game panic. but. Um, Young men are often using video games, you know, they're collaborative. It's not all everyone trying to gun each other down or it's, 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 a, it's benign competition. It's, uh, it's male bonding. It's healthy and social. It's text-based. It like promotes reading skills. Uh, there, there's a lot that's social and educational about it that is probably, uh, probably even healthier than the ways in which um, some young women are using social media. And also yeah. young men have just historically had, I think, worse mental health rights actually, or they, they, they're, their literal suicide rate is significantly worse. Um, the, I mean, the, the kind of sad thing about it is that when young men attempt suicide, they're more likely to succeed uh, than women are. Um, now, young women have been catching up. Again, mental health rates for young people very bad. There's a lot you know, going on that I don't think is totally explained by social media at all. I know some people like Jonathan Haidt think the existence of social media really is the thing. Um, I'm not persuaded by that, and we've, you know, we've had a long debate on the subject, but, but I certainly don't disagree with them that social media is a problem for some kids, and if that's your kid, absolutely you know, talk with a counselor, talk with the kid, find a, find a rate of social media use that makes them better off. Um, I, again, I'm not, I'm not saying there's no problem at all, but the problem is within our own ability to solve, and none of the solutions, if you want to talk about government solutions, none, none of the things they propose doing um, sound good and also so obviously just violate like basic first like would not stand up in court yeah i mean so this happened after your book was published but uh i know that you wrote about i wrote about it i i quoted you texas uh republicans including a very prominent free market think tank the texas public policy foundation uh, they unveiled this plan to ban minors from social media in the state of texas like yeah. legislatively and i i guess one sounds illegal bro but two also weren't these people just screaming about parental rights a hot second ago like explain for us steel man it why is this not a feasible solution if somebody thinks there is a big problem yeah you can't it's a terrible idea to sub uh, substitute parents judgment for what's best for their kids for the state's judgment it's just i don't know why any conservative on earth would think that's a good approach. The state is ideologically progressive. Uh, the apparatus of the state, the bureaucracy, is always is the enemy of these conservatives who want to empower state bureaucrats to decide how you should parent your children. Um, the other thing is, and, and this should really shut down the conversation entirely, is that it is obviously unconstitutional to do this. The Supreme Court, it, the actually the video game analogy is very, very apt here, right? The Supreme Court held in a decision authored by Antonin Scalia, the uh, RIP, but the, the head of, you know, the intellectual leader of conservatism as recently as a decade ago, so re more recently than that, he authored this, um, the, the California, the outcome, the Supreme Court case was the Cal California, state of California's ban on selling violent video games to, to minors. And the Supreme Court invalidated that, saying that the state could not insert itself into that sale between uh, video game uh, merchants and, and teenagers and kids. So if that, and, and he gave a very, it was a very principled First Amendment uh, maximalizing standpoint that the state could not inter interfere there. If that stuff, and it's a very clear precedent for what we're talking about now, there's no way you could structure a law 
that, that prevents young people from using social media that doesn't run afoul of the First Amendment. Maybe if it was, if, you know, if we were narrowly crafted, we're only talking about pornography or something like that, you might be able to get away with it because, you know, there are category, there are exceptions, categories, there are exceptions to the First Amendment, but a, a blanket ban on social media use or even trying to tweak you know, that it scrolls too fast or it reloads or like all loot boxes, all the things that your Josh Hawley type Republicans um, are, are railing against. It's never going to it's never going to stand up to Supreme Court scrutiny. I don't believe not not unless the court was like completely replaced with different people. The conservatives on the court, we do have a conservative court, but they are like a Mac, a free speech maximalist court. Based. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, I guess just to ask, though, is it the speech element that makes it different? The art element, because you can ban car companies from selling a car to someone until they're 16. Apparently you can ban vaping until they're 21. It's like there are age limits that have been upheld on all sorts of things. Why is this different? Yeah, it's the speech. It's the speech element. It's pure speech. Now, I, I would be against maybe some of those bans as well. I don't know. Certainly the vaping ban. Uh, but I, my, my thinking is we're talking about, you know, at its core, it is, it is speech. It is pure speech, the, the thing most directly uh, protected by the First Amendment. And that video game decision really did liken video games to speech. They liken them to literature. They liken them to, uh, Scalia talked about how, are these violent video games any more violent or scary than like the Grimm's fairy tales? Like it would be just like, he explicitly made it about how banning these things would be just like banning um, literature. I, I'd have to imagine they would take the same approach to social media. So you talk in the book about a couple small areas where you think uh, because I, I completely agree with you, to be clear, about the bans and also the tweaks like Josh Hawley, his legislation a few years ago would have banned Snapchat streaks, which is when you get like <laughs> every day in a row, the number goes up, the more days you exchange snaps with somebody. It's like it's just absolute nanny state Karen policy making. Yeah. But uh, there are, you know, some real issues. Like, for example, you talk in the book about revenge porn, which is where people, you know, to get back at somebody post pornography that of them in publicly without their consent, and then they can never get it back or they really struggle to get it taken down. You know, there is these these issues with that, with uh, kids increasingly being exposed to pornography on the internet at extremely young ages. I mean, I think these are real concerns. What role, if any, do you think there is for government policy or parental solutions to those kinds of things? Right. So, so most of the conversation about doing something to fix social media revolves around, um, you know, if we're talking about uh, progressives, we're talking about like antitrust. Some Republicans too feel that way. We're talking about the bias and censorship aspect. Um, all of those, I think, are very bad reasons to to regulate social media. But I do take, you know, somewhat more seriously some of the privacy concerns, um, the, the things you're talking about. Also, just you know, crime and violent crime and terrorism to the extent it's being organized on social media. That is a legitimate thing for the government to pursue. Actually, and actually, the so existing social media platforms cooperate totally with the government on those fronts. Facebook reports um, uh, sex trafficking and violent imagery to the FBI constantly, constantly. They're like the number one reporters of these things. They are being vigilant for these things. They're always accused of not doing enough, but they're doing tons, tons to purge this kind of stuff from the internet. I, I think in, in the revenge porn case, yeah, it's, it's not quite covered under existing law. There, there's broad liability protection that I, I think is mostly appropriate, but I would be willing to tweak it so that they do have an obligation to take it down when they identify it. There are a couple, few, but there are some of these very egregious cases where um, platforms would not take down, and sometimes more fringe platforms than the you know, major ones we're talking about, but would not take down uh, compromising videos or photos that were posted, or they took them down and then they got put back up and they said, you know, oh, sorry, we, we did it once, we're done. I, I think uh, that could, in theory, work more like copyright, where they get like a notice to take, to, like you have to take this down in the next however many days or you're going to be in violation. Uh, that would be a tweak I'd be willing to see to existing law. You know, the U.S. Um, is sort of where privacy and free speech, where they intersect, and, and sometimes they do, they conflict, right? They're, on one hand, the, the, the desire to keep private things, videos, it's, you know, information you, you would not want out there does conflict with a maximally robust free speech policy, which would say you should be able to say or do, you say whatever you want, even if it's lies, even if you don't have the right to say, what, you know, whatever it is. They do, they do conflict at, at points, and the U.S. law, the, 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 uh, the winner in these conflicts is free speech. 
This is not actually how it is in a lot of other parts of the world. Um, Europe, for instance, defaults far more toward privacy. So actually, you under, under EU law, you can petition Google to take down search results for yourself that you don't like. And Google is required, required to do that by law. And actually, about half of the takedown requests they get, they take them down. So you could never have that in the US because of our First Amendment. That's how the EU handles it. Now, in that case, I would probably prefer the way we do it. Uh, but there, there are, what I'm saying is there are different, you know, classically liberal, you know, Western governments uh, of a similar philosophy to ours that have decided these questions very differently. So it's worth at least considering what they've done. I think in most cases, it's, at, it's harder to, um, to reveal information that is in the public benefit at, at, because you run the risk of, because the libel defamation uh, standards are, are so much lower than ours are. Uh, it's so much easier to sue someone. So I think we've mostly gotten this better, but look, there are a couple cases where internet is, the internet's gonna make it so much easier to invasively violate someone's privacy in a way that does not serve the public interest and is just malicious, that we should think through thoughtfully if there are new strategies to combat that. But what about the pornography issue? Because I've never been at all on board with like the super tradcon, ban porn, this kind of thing, but I have always thought they have some valid concerns about minors because, for example, whatever age verification little law or policies that we do have on pornography are an absolute joke. It's like you click a box, yes, I'm over 18. Wow, they're really stopped by that. And then, you know, to get into really fraught territory, someplace like Pornhub recently, you know, had to do massive takedowns because there was tons of underage pornography clearly labeled as such rife throughout their platform for years and i just i think that's an area of this internet tech policy thing where i don't know if the, if the solution is more government but clearly something ha has gone wrong i'm not even anti-porn right if an adult wants to look at it i don't care but it's it's clearly become too ubiquitous and I, i've read like the the average boy sees it at like age seven for the first time now or 10 i don't know the number but it's like shockingly young far too young um what do you make of all that um in terms of the well i so i agree with you uh that pornhub was really up to some nefarious things and they were uh, so they previously had the policy essentially that you could just make an anonymous account and post like anything what and could go wrong Right. That to me is crazy. Um, I, I like. I do think that's crazy, and that they had too much protection to do that. I mean, it was, but what essentially happened is the New York Times wrote a a story. It, it was um, uh, Christoph uh, wrote uh, wrote about this practice, and then the credit card co uh, credit card companies stopped working with Pornhub, and Pornhub had to change its policy. So you can no longer make an anonymous account that can just post anything. Now you have to at least be registered uh, in some way so that the site knows who you are, which then if you post something you're not allowed to post or it's revenge porn or it's under it, then at least now they have the information on you and they can go after you. So I think at, at a minimum that was good scrutiny, that they, they was correct to give them that scrutiny, a policy of letting anyone post whatever they want. If it's, you know, it's, it's one thing if it's Facebook lets you post whatever you want basically because they don't allow porn at all, right? It's not, it, it's, on, on Pornhub there should be a, there's a, there's a, greater sense of danger, right, to, to what might be, might be posting. So I, I think it's totally appropriate for them to have changed that policy. Um, and, and, you know, maybe there are some, again, I, I, I think there should be some requirement to not let people uh, post stuff that's clearly without, that, that they don't have the permission to post. On the broader question of young people encountering it too early, um, I don't even know, I don't think uh, Pornhub employs any age verification to, to use. Um, if it does, that's news to me. Um, some, I think, some, like OnlyFans, like has to it takes your information if you're going to use it. I think, um, you know. So would more of that stuff stop younger people from seeing it? I don't know. Um, I, I guess I would be, in theory, willing to support age verification type stuff, or like maybe you got to put in a. Um, you know, a driver's license or something. Look, I, 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 I think my standards is the Supreme Court, right? So I agree that the Supreme Court would be okay limiting people under the age of 16 or maybe even 18 or something, uh, limiting their access to this. I, I see how um, being exposed to this in early age certainly can be harmful. Um, I, I, I take the, I, I think the concerns about addiction to it are we don't quite have enough data to assert that addiction to it is a widespread problem or is having widespread negative consequences, but I can certainly understand the argument that it is. 
I, I, I too hear anecdotally from young people, from young men, that uh, you know this is kind of warping their expectations, or you know have some of them having trouble forming relationships because they're so addicted to this. So look, I get it. Um, I haven't really heard a great solution to it, and to some extent, this is going to be a problem. Like the cat is out of the box here. We're not, you know, we're not going to be able to like it, it's out there. You're not if you the more you try to. You can put up barriers, you can make it harder. Maybe that's worth doing, but it's out there and young people are still, like we're just living in a world where young people are pretty easily gonna have access um, to porn. Now, of course, they've had access to pornographic magazines for forever. You wanna say this is you know, way more harmful because there's just so much more of it and you know, more of it is just violent and obscene Extreme. or something like that. Extreme. Look, I, yeah, I, I guess, um, although when you start to dig into some of the statistics, there are always like some interesting ones, like the um, like uh, uh, violent pornography is far more popular among women, actually, than among men. There's some interesting things like that. Um, there are tons of women um, looking at porn in, in way, and we, that we never talk about as, um, as warping or distorting or having some horrible impact on their mental health. So again, to the extent this is pro a problem, this seems like a problem for a subset of users who might be uh, well served by better parenting or having some parental guardrails or you know individual limits that fall outside the realm of state action. I mean, I just I, I uh, I'm always pretty skeptical that they'll actually be able to change any of this behavior, even though I think it is unfortunate and and potentially harmful because it's like say that you pass a law banning anyone under 16. Well, guess what? They just set their VPN to Canada. Like and boom, yeah. they're in. I mean, I've seen this with a lot of the. the or same you get thing your with, older cousin's license or whatever. It's it's it's. I th I think especially teenage boys will circumvent it pretty easily. Um, and not to say that that means it's not worth trying or anything, but all of these government attempts to regulate and crack down on on social media for underage people would be written by boomers or or older. And they don't understand how these things work, yet they think they're going to write laws that are going to modify the behavior of the most tech-savvy generation we've ever seen. It, yeah. it seems foolish to me. I guess, though, um, if you could leave people, and, and uh, we'll put the link to the book uh, in the show notes, but it, it, one message, like one takeaway for people from this body of work and this research that you've done, what is it? It would be don't panic. Uh, a lot of the problems people have with the sites are going to be solved by the sites being outcompeted. There's going to be new social media sites that will have new problems. But right, there's so much. We, we're living through this era of great panic over Facebook specifically. We haven't talked about this so much, but the you know the sort of progressive panic about how social uh, social media and Facebook specifically has broken our democracy, has allowed all this misinformation, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, man, Facebook might not even be around that much longer. Like, I know they're a giant company, but they're they are struggling. They are cratering with the user base they want. They're not popular with young people anymore. They never will be again. They never will be again. And the people who say, oh no, they're such a monopoly. They can never, you know, they're occupy this space forever. I remember when it was my I, my space seemed dominant, and they got outcompeted by Facebook. They sold, you know, for a fraction of what they were worth a few years before. Um, this happened to uh, search engines that were competitive before Google. I couldn't, when I was a teenager, I wouldn't, if you told me there's going to be a day where AOL Instant Messenger doesn't exist, I'd say, what, does that mean like a comet hit Earth and we're not alive anymore? Well, like that's Internet how important. Explorer. Internet Explorer. Like you can go back to all of these things that seemed so, like they've changed the world, they're dominant, and there's, but there's been so much chaos, so much legitimate market competition in the tech space, in part because it's ephemeral. It's a vibe. It's a, it's, there's a coolness to it. Once you lose that, you cannot get that back. It's not the same as like the oil company that owns all the oil fields or something. And then they, they really, it's how are they going to face competition? Although, you know, even there, people innovate around that. This is ephemeral. It's vibes. It's coolness. That factor when they lose it, and they do lose it. They inevitably lose it because of young people coming along and liking something else. Now they're all losing ground to TikTok, which comes, by the way, with its own problems. I'm not saying there won't be any new problems in the future. TikTok being very beholden to the Chinese Communist Party is a massive problem. But, but it, sol it resolves some of the uh, kind of a, uh, addiction and the, the negative body image issue on Instagram. I think it's actually a lot healthier on TikTok because TikTok is more of a... 
I, I think create entrepreneurially creative kind of platform for less young people. Less superficial. Less superficial for sure. I mean, they're they're making really cool videos on it. They're fun to watch. Now, I, I have other Especially other problems TikToks. to be clear. Are your TikToks really good, Brad? No, right? mine are I, I think like I political. Follow... They get a lot of views, but they don't. Uh, but it's not like I'm not like a TikToker, like with the dances and the jokes and the skits and stuff. I don't do that. I think I follow two people on uh, TikTok. I, well, I like Rising and Reason. Maybe you'll be maybe you'll be my third follow, Brad. That would mean the world. All right, Robbie. Everybody, check out his book. Robbie, thanks so much. My pleasure.